This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. The Humanist Report podcast is funded by viewers like you through Patreon and PayPal. To support the show, visit patreon.com forward slash humanist report or become a member at humanistreport.com. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Humanist Report Podcast. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is episode 268 of the program. Today is Friday, November 27th, and before we get started, I want to take some time to thank all of the individuals who make this show possible. All of our Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members, all of which either signed up for the very first time to support us this week or increased the monthly pledge that they were already giving to us. And that includes Barter Club, Corey Schiffman, David Carney, Eric Miller, Joanna Voisin, Lucas Dykes, Matt Six, Melissa Murphy, Oscar Barroso, Richard Scott Wigton, Soul Light 16, TA15, Vizves Conzo, Teresa Gosnell, Tyler Weichel, and Tyra Hoke. So thank you so much to all of these kind individuals. If you'd also like to support the show and join the independent progressive media revolution, you can do so by going to humanistreport.com slash support patreon.com slash humanist report by clicking join underneath any one of our youtube videos or by streaming our content on means tv and hey if you can't support us monetarily you can just watch the program like our videos and uh, that honestly really helps a lot at least with youtube's algorithm if you're watching there uh so uh we've got a pretty lengthy show this week on the show donald trump finally concedes to joe biden um Kinda. (laughs) So we'll talk about that. Also, his supporters are now vowing to destroy the careers of any politicians in the Republican Party who betrayed Donald Trump when he was trying to steal an election he clearly lost. And of course, Congresswoman-elect Marjorie Taylor Greene will not be among those Republicans because she is indeed a Trump cultist who explains on Newsmax TV how Democrats successfully rigged Georgia's election against Donald Trump but forgot to rig the election against her. And speaking of Marjorie Taylor Greene, she decided to randomly attack Ilhan Omar for seemingly no reason. And while we're on the subject of the squad, Nikki Haley tried to dunk on AOC, but as you're going to see, it didn't turn out too well for her. Also, COVID-19 is rising in this country rapidly, but we do have some genuinely good news regarding therapeutics and vaccines. But of course, we still need to be careful. But Ted Cruz and other MAGA chuds are encouraging people to ignore warnings just to own the libs, I guess. So we'll talk about that, and we'll also talk about the release of domestic terrorist Kyle Rittenhouse and, you know, why this shows how dysfunctional our so-called criminal justice system is. But first, Joe Biden's administration is beginning to take shape. We'll look at the warmongers and corporatists that he is appointing to high positions of power. And we will also share an op-ed from Aaron Brockovich, who calls out a particular particularly egregious individual associated with Team Biden. That's what we've got on the agenda for today's episode. Let's waste no time and get right to it. So we are continuing to learn more and more about who Joe Biden will be putting in his administration. And unsurprisingly, most of his picks, with a few exceptions, are completely terrible people. Yeah. Ronald Klain is someone who we found out about last week. He will be Joe Biden's chief of staff. And this individual has had a long career at a venture capital firm. Oh, goody. But this week, he announced more picks for key roles, including Tony Blinken as Secretary of State, Alejandro Mayorkas as DHS Secretary, Linda Thomas-Greenfield as UN Ambassador, John Kerry as Climate Envoy with NSC seat, Avril Haines as Director of National Intelligence, and Jake Sullivan as National Security Advisor. Now, not all of these names are terrible. I think that Linda Thomas-Greenfield as UN Ambassador... That doesn't necessarily uh, concern me. I think that Alejandro Mayorkas, uh, he is the individual who basically is the architect of DACA during the Obama era. So I don't I don't have any problems with him being DHS secretary. However, what I do have a problem with is Tony Blinken and to a lesser extent, Jake Sullivan, who is basically the same type of person. Tony Blinken is an individual who has repeatedly defended the atrocities of the apartheid state of Israel, and he bragged about defending them. He bragged about the United States being the only country to defend Israel when everyone else in the world condemned their behavior. Take a look. That unprecedented support is true in terms of our vigilance to protect Israel's legitimacy on the world stage and fight for its full and equal participation in UN institutions. We help secure Israel's permanent membership 
in the Western European and Others Group, as well as its membership in the Like-Minded Human Rights Caucus, from which it had long been excluded in New York. Last year, the United States opposed 18 resolutions in the UN General Assembly that were biased against Israel. On five occasions last year, the U.S. cast the only no vote against unfair anti-Israel measures in the UN's Human Rights Council. We will... We will continue to stand with Israel and against one-sided biased resolutions, even if we are the only country on earth to do so. So someone who is pro-apartheid, who's literally racist against Palestinians and Muslims in the Middle East, that individual, I don't think is qualified to be secretary of state. But when it comes to his foreign policy, he is arguably to the right of Joe Biden on foreign policy. So as Jake Johnson of Common Dreams reports, Blinken served as Deputy National Security Advisor and Deputy Secretary of State in the Obama administration, and as the Washington Post reported Sunday, has been described as having a centrist view of the world and has also supported interventionist positions. Oh goody. He once broke with Biden and supported military action in Libya, for example, the Post noted, referring to the Obama White House's catastrophic decision to join with NATO to bomb that country, an armed intervention that helped helped unleash a violent civil war that is still ongoing. When it came to Syria policy under Obama, Blinken is also reported to have supported aggressive military measures against the government of President Bashar al-Assad, and more recently has indicated that the Biden administration would opt for leaving U.S. troops in the war-torn country. When Biden, then a senator and chairman of the powerful Senate Foreign Relations Committee, voted in 2002 to authorize the Bush administration's disastrous invasion of Iraq, a decision he has since described as a mistake, Blinken was the Democratic staff director of the committee. The Intercept's Ryan Grimm reported last July that Blinken helped craft Biden's own support for the Iraq war. Speaking to the New York Times earlier this year, Blinken characterized the vote to invade Iraq as a vote for tough diplomacy. That's not diplomacy. That's the lack of diplomacy. So we will have a president who supported the invasion of Iraq and a secretary of state, Tony Blinken, who supported the invasion of Iraq, tweeted Medea Benjamin, co-founder of anti war group Code Pink. In the U.S., there is no accountability for supporting the worst foreign policy disaster in modern history. Only rewards. So this is the individual who will be Secretary of State. Now, speaking of ghouls who are hawkish, uh, John Kerry will also play a key part in Biden's administration as the climate envoy. And as Andrea Germanos of Common Dreams explains, Food and Water Action called the choice an alarming red flag, and the group's executive director, Winona Hodder, accused Kerry of being a longtime apologist for fossil fuel fracking and a reliable promoter of false climate solutions like market-based carbon trading schemes. Kerry's proposals are tired ideas from years past that will do little or nothing to address our climate crisis and will actually continue to place a disproportionate unjust burden on vulnerable communities that have borne the brunt of fossil fuel pollution and climate impacts for decades now, she said. As such, we have our work cut out for us, added Hodder. Now, I will say that even though uh, food and water action are speaking out against John Kerry, there isn't universal condemnation within progressive circles because Greenpeace USA, as well as uh, Sunrise, they are actually coming out and saying, we're not too angry about uh, this decision here to make John Kerry, the climate envoy. In fact, the co-founder and executive director of the Sunrise Movement, Varshini Prakash, tweeted out support for Kerry, saying, I served with Secretary Kerry this summer on the Biden-Sanders task force, and one thing is clear. He really does care about stopping climate change. That's something we can work with. An encouraging move from the Biden team. Now, I'm keeping my eyes peeled for a domestic equivalent. Now, on top of that, John Kerry did say that the United States has to do more than just getting back into the Paris Climate Accord, which is encouraging. However, I'm not as optimistic as my fellow progressives here because John Kerry is someone who has been in government forever, and he is a centrist, arguably a moderate Republican. And if he truly believed that climate change was the national emergency that he said it was when this position was announced, then don't you think he would have opted to endorse someone other than Joe Biden. He endorsed Joe Biden in the Democratic Party primaries when there were other options available with more solid climate change policies. Bernie Sanders. He could have even endorsed Elizabeth Warren or Jay Inslee. I mean, the bar is super low.
but he endorsed Joe Biden, someone with a bad plan when it comes to climate change. I mean, better than Donald Trump, of course, but in comparison with Bernie Sanders, climate organizations rated him, what was it, a D, D minus. So if you truly cared about climate change and say it is as big of an emergency uh, as it is, then why wouldn't you endorse someone and put politics aside who actually cares? John Kerry knows that if he endorsed Bernie Sanders, he wouldn't get a spot in Bernie's administration and, you know, endorsing Joe Biden would secure him another job. But if you truly care about climate change, don't you put politics aside? So that's why I'm not optimistic. But here's what I say to John Kerry. Prove me wrong. Prove to me that my cynicism is unwarranted. Don't think I'm going to be proven wrong, but I would love to stand corrected here. Now, when it comes to Avril Haines, she's going to be appointed as Director of National Intelligence and um, there's some red flags, <laughs> to say the least. I think I'm being incredibly charitable to describe my concerns about her as red flags, because as Alex Koch pointed out, Avril Haines helped create the legal justification for Obama's drone wars, helped cover up the CIA's torture program, and then supported Gina Haspel to lead the agency and consulted for Palantir. Haines is credited with moderating the drone policy. People say without her, there would have been even more drone bombings. She also worked to make sure the drone bombings they did were legal. Sounds kind of like being a proponent of clean coal, but people die instantly. And he's exactly right. It's not just immoral, but illegal. Not only under domestic law, but international law as well. This individual should be nowhere near power, but yet she's going to get a spot in Biden's administration. And what has the mainstream media said about this? Well, that we should be happy because a woman is serving in this position, and this is historic. I mean, I'm sure that the people in Pakistan, Yemen, and Somalia who are having bombs dropped on their heads by Biden's administration will take comfort knowing that it's a woman who's bombing them instead of a man. So there's that. Despicable. Um, now, on top of that, Janet Yellen will be Treasury Secretary. Let me just take a moment to laugh at Elizabeth Warren, who sold out Bernie Sanders to get a spot in Biden's administration only to be shunned. But Janet Yellen is not someone who I am enthusiastic about. Wall Street is excited about her. That tells you everything you need to know. And additionally, someone who is being considered by Joe Biden is someone who should be nowhere near power. We're talking about Rahm Emanuel for Transportation Secretary. And the fact that Joe Biden would even consider someone this morally bankrupt, I mean, it speaks to how shitty Joe Biden is as a human being. And I think that AOC put it best. What is so hard to understand about this? Rahm Emanuel helped cover up the murder of Laquan McDonald. Covering up a murder is disqualifying for public leadership. Now, there's good news and bad news with regard to Rahm Emanuel. The good news is that Biden hears our complaints and concerns, and he's trying to uh, respond to that. The bad news is that his response is to placate us. And rather than making Rahm Emanuel transportation secretary, now he wants to put Rahm Emanuel in a less visible position. Why do you have to have Rahm Emanuel in your administration? Are we not going to draw the line anywhere? He covered up the murder of Laquan McDonald. Does that not mean anything to you? Does that not like strike a chord? I don't get it. Why do you have to put him in your administration? And the thing about uh, Joe Biden that you're going to see is that there's this ongoing theme that the people who he is appointing to his administration, it's all Obama era alum. <laughs> so, I mean, this is this is really concerning and it should be concerning to people. It's not surprising. None of this is surprising to me. But here is why you should be concerned about this. If Joe Biden conducts business as usual and we just basically see a continuation of Obama's administration, a third Obama term, if you will. Uh, what's going to happen? Well, Obama's failures is part of the reason why we got a Donald Trump presidency. So if Joe Biden doesn't actually make meaningful changes and materially improve people's lives in 2024, do you honestly expect him to win again? I think he probably would have lost had it not been for Joe uh, for Donald Trump's bungling of COVID-19. So do we honestly believe that if Joe Biden just gets in there and occupies the Oval Office for four years and does fuck all to help Americans that he's going to be rewarded with a second term or Democrats will be rewarded with a second term. I mean, if you are worried about right-wing extremism in this country, then you shouldn't be worried about the fact or uh, angry about the fact that I'm criticizing Joe Biden. You should join me in criticizing Joe Biden, because if you are afraid of Republicans taking power again, then understand that if Joe Biden changes nothing, 
they will be emboldened and more powerful than ever in 2024. And I get that that's a ways away. We can't necessarily think that far ahead, sure. But do you honestly think that just having someone who's not Trump in power will suffice? That that's enough? If so, then you are in an incredibly privileged position. So it's frustrating because if you tune into mainstream media, they talk about how diverse all of these picks are and how historic it is that, uh, you know, Biden is appointing a woman to this position and that position. But at the end of the day, Americans are going to lose faith in your party and give Republicans the keys to power again if you fuck this up. Joe Biden has a unique opportunity. We are we're at a crossroads in American history. He can actually make change. And all of this tells us right now, the people who he's choosing to surround him during this presidency, it, it tells us that he's not up to the challenge. This is what progressives had warned you about. So I've been really critical of people who Joe Biden is appointing to his administration, and I think for good reason. And I've made my arguments but I think it's really important that we hear from people who have been activists for quite some time because their perspective is very valuable because they know the intricate details about how specific companies hurt communities in this country. So The Intercept reports Biden EPA transition team member helped DuPont dodge responsibility for PFOA. Michael McCabe, a former EPA official and aide to Joe Biden, led the defense of the toxic PFAS chemical PFOA. Now, the fact that anyone associated with a company who did any polluting whatsoever is going to work for Joe Biden in and of itself is scandalous, but I'm not going to share my opinion about this because I think that Erin Brockovich, a longtime activist, she said everything that I wanted to say in an open letter to Joe Biden titled, Dear Joe Biden, Are You Kidding Me? And she writes, Dare I say, I had hopes that this new administration would usher in the dawning of a new day. As picks for President-elect Joe Biden's Environmental Protection Agency transition team were announced, I felt concerned and disheartened about a chemical industry insider being on the list. Are you kidding me? Michael McCabe, a former employee of Biden and a former Deputy Environmental Protection Agency Administrator, later jumped ship to work as a consultant on communication strategy for DuPont during a time when the chemical company was looking to fight regulations of their star chemical, PFOA, also known as C8. The toxic man-made chemical is used in everything, from waterproof clothes, stain-resistant textiles and food packaging to nonstick pans. The compound has been linked to lowered fertility, cancer, and liver damage. The Guardian reported this week that Harvard School of Public Health professor Felipe Grangin, who studies environmental health, warns that PFAS chemicals, of which PFOA is one, might reduce the efficacy of a COVID-19 vaccine. This smells of the dawn of the same old. To quote the WHO, meet the new boss same as the old boss. It should go without saying that someone who advised DuPont on how to avoid regulations is not someone who we want advising this new administration. PFOA pollutes the blood of nearly every American and can pass from mother to unborn child in the womb. This toxic product of industry is a stable compound not easily broken down in the environment, giving it the nickname Forever Chemical. Scientists have found it in living beings across the globe, from animals living in the depths of the sea to birds on remote islands. The Environmental Protection Agency has set no enforceable national drink and water limits for perfluorinated chemicals, including PFOA. Tens of thousands of community drinking water systems across the country have never Never even been tested for these contaminants. McCabe started managing DuPont's communications with the EPA about the toxic chemical in 2003, according to an article in The Intercept. This was the time in which DuPont faced a barrage of litigation after the company dumped 7,100 tons of PFOA-filled waste in West Virginia, which made its way into the drinking water of 100,000 people. Countless members of the community faced debilitating illnesses as a result. The legal battle with the company was turned into the film Dark Water in 2019. Mind you, DuPont suspected that their product was harmful since the 1960s. Experiments they conducted in 1961 showed that PFOS affected the livers of dogs and rabbits. McCabe's work inevitably contributed to staving off costly cleanup and additional regulation headaches for the company. Are we the people supposed to trust a former DuPont man in a transition team tasked with reviewing the chemical safety board? Is this how the newly elected leadership wants to start what is supposed to be a healing and unifying administration? And the answer to that is yes. Because Joe Biden is going to be a healer and a unifier. Not for the working class, though. 
for the capitalist and business class, for corporate America. They're all going to love him because his policies aren't going to be that different from Donald Trump. There's going to be some positive changes, but for the most part, you know, there, there's no mean tweets. People can basically ignore Joe Biden. He's not this spectacle as Trump is. And, you know, it's it's easier for people to put aside all of Joe Biden's flaws and go back to brunch and pretend as if everything is copacetic, when in actuality, Joe Biden needs to be fought. It's not a matter of pushing Joe Biden to the left, because that would suggest that he was ever malleable in the first place. It's a matter of fighting Joe Biden, fighting him on things like this, because an industry shill for DuPont, that's not someone who's going to be looking out for us. And the fact that anyone, I don't care if you're a corporate Democrat or a Republican, would appoint someone like this, it's idiotic. It's idiotic because you're putting someone in control that doesn't care if your own family is poisoned. I mean, rich people aren't completely shielded in their mansions from bad drinking water. And, you know, they, they need breathable air too. So it's, it's self-destructive and it's self-defeating for an administration that supposedly claimed that, oh, well, he, he knows the task ahead and he's got to be like the next FDR. Give me a fucking break. Give me a fucking break. It's why when there are people who um, tried to make the case for Joe Biden by championing his so-called progressive platform, I mean, this is why we were skeptical because Joe Biden has a long hist history of doing things like this. And Erin Brockovich, it's important that she speaks up because she knows about all of this. She has firsthand experience dealing with this. There's literally a movie about Erin Brockovich. So, um... <sighs> You know, it's not surprising, but because we're not surprised doesn't mean that we should uh, be unmoved and not be infuriated and not call him out. We have to educate people about these sort of things. And I think that Aaron Brockovich is doing a public service by calling out Joe Biden here. In what I believe is a shocking turn of events, Donald J. Trump, current president of the United States, has admitted that he lost this election. He has conceded to Joe Biden, albeit informally and unofficially, but nonetheless, it still is a concession. Now, what this means is that his coup attempt has officially failed. I can confidently say that Donald Trump will not be able to steal this election. And we'll talk about all the specifics as to why I think that it's safe to conclude this, but let's talk about why he is conceding, because he has instructed the individual in charge of the General Services Administration, Emily Murphy, to go ahead with the transition process, meaning I know I'm leaving and I know that Biden is coming in and let's begin that process. So he tweeted out, I want to thank Emily Murphy at GSA for her steadfast dedication and loyalty to our country. Yeah, right. More like loyalty to Donald Trump. Uh, she has been harassed, threatened and abused. And I do not want to see this happen to her, her family or employees of GSA. Our case strongly continues. Sure, we will keep up the good fight and I believe we will prevail. No, you don't. Nevertheless, in the best interest of our country, I am recommending that Emily and her team do what needs to be done with regard to initial protocols and I've told my team to do the same. Now, when he says, do what needs to be done, that's his way of saying, start the transition process because Biden is going to be the next president. Now, look, publicly, he's still, in spite of this, going to maintain the facade that there's still a chance because we talked about this before. This is a grift for Donald Trump. What he's doing is he's trying to get all of his supporters, primarily his cultists, to donate to his legal defense fund when in actuality they're paying down his campaign debt and contributing to his newly formed super PAC so he can still have control over the Republican Party. Meanwhile, it's over. In fact, his lawyers are still going on television saying Donald Trump won and we're going to prove that he won. Take a look. The point of all this <laughs> well, the point of this, of course, is to get to fair and accurate results because the election was stolen and President Trump won by a landslide. And how you're mischaracterizing this, I think that your viewers need to understand the truth of this. So Donald Trump didn't just win. He won by a landslide. I mean, we're getting further and further away from reality. But meanwhile, it's over. Trump has told his aides that he knows it's over and he's already planning for his life after the presidency. And he may announce a 2024 run. You wouldn't be talking about these things if you didn't acknowledge that you lost this election. But again, 
he has to maintain this facade so he can continue to raise money. He's going to maintain this as long as he possibly can. Meanwhile, it's already official. Emily Murphy has already signed off on the transition process. So there's nothing left that he can do. It's over. States are certifying the results. The Electoral College will make it official in December. And there's nothing left for him to do. There's no more avenues that he can take to steal this election. Now, I will say that even though his coup attempt was unsuccessful, that doesn't necessarily mean that what he did throughout these last couple of weeks did not do long-term damage to our democracy. Because what he was able to prove was that if you truly want to pull off a coup attempt in America, it's really not that difficult. It's really, really easy to get at least half of the Republican Party's base to believe that this election was rigged, and furthermore, Democrats proved that even while there's an active coup attempt, they're not going to fight back. They're just going to uh, fist bump individuals who are trying to get entire counties that went for Biden invalidated, as we saw with Kamala Harris and Lindsey Graham. And on top of that, they're, they're not really going to say anything as there's this active effort to overturn the results of the election. So in the event down the road, we get an election result that's closer not as easy to steal with a more competent fascist that the Republican Party establishment likes, we could actually see a coup be successful. And that's horrifying. And I want people to understand the gravity of this situation. There are some people who just love to do damage control for Donald Trump and downplay the severity of the coup, like Michael Tracy, who is talking about how, oh, well, this isn't a coup. Trump Going ahead with this transition process basically proves that this was never a coup attempt, except a coup isn't black or white. There are different types of coups. Not all coups occur violently and by use of force. Some coups are soft coups, political coups, where you have an individual who is an opportunist exploit the flaws in our political institutions to consolidate power in an illegitimate way. That's exactly what Donald Trump tried to do. I mean, to say that this wasn't a coup attempt is as ridiculous as saying there wasn't a coup in Bolivia, where we saw the results of the election be called into question this time by an international entity, OAS, and then we have the fascists, you know, they ousted Evo Morales, but when MAS, the Socialist Party, won that election, you know, the fascists ultimately accepted the results of that election, and they conceded. That was still a coup, the coup ultimately failed, but nonetheless, it was still a coup attempt. So I, so I think that we have to call it what it is. That's really important because if we don't call it what it is, then we can't fix the problem and prevent it in the future. We have to make fundamental changes to our system to prevent a coup from taking place. Donald Trump, in a way, kind of did us a service by proving how fragile democracy is, even here in America. Now, what he did was he tried to steal this election by two methods. The first method was through the courts. We all know that he stacked the federal judiciary with his loyalists, but still he lost because his legal team presented zero evidence in court. They had more than 30 cases thrown out and all that they were left to do was try to, you know, grasp for some procedural victories. You know, they had a recount in Georgia and then Trump says, okay, well, let's do another recount, even though that's not going to change anything. Let's do it anyway so we can convince my, you know, cultists that we're doing something. But, I mean, it's abundantly clear that legally and through the courts, Trump isn't going to be able to overturn the results of this election. That's just not a feasible way of stealing it. So what he then tried to do was pivot to plan B, where he tries to find loyalists in each state to overturn the will of voters in that state. Now, we talked about this before the election because Barton Gellman wrote an article for The Atlantic where he explains that Trump's legal team already said they were pursuing this as an option, where basically, if Biden wins a state and it's close, they tried to cry fraud and then get that state's Republican legislature to overturn the results. Now, this is tough to do because Biden won multiple states in uh, battleground states. So it's not like there was just like one or two states that Trump needed to overturn. There were a lot of states that Trump needed to overturn and steal in order to make this coup successful. So it was more difficult. But he focused on Michigan because if he were able to be successful in Michigan, well, perhaps that could, you know, give more... Uh, Republicans in other states' confidence that they too can pull off this coup. So after Republican lawmakers in Michigan vocalized some interest in appointing their own electors to vote against Biden even though he won their state, well, the Republican Senate Majority Leader Mike Shirky 
basically stated that that's not going to happen. We're not going to do that because, you know, just overturning the results in that one state, you're not going to change the result of the election nationally and you're just going to piss off a lot of people. So if you need this to happen, it's got to happen in multiple states. It's got to be much more of a coordinated effort. So Mike Shirky said, no, we're not going to do this. And Mike Shirky, he may be seemingly reasonable based on what I'm telling you that he won't just like overturn the will of his state's voters. I know the bar is low, uh, but this also is a right wing extremist. And uh, once he vocalized that uh, he's not going to be stealing this election, overturning his state's results in favor of Donald Trump by appointing their own electors to the Electoral College to vo vote against Biden. Well, then what happened was incredibly disturbing. Mike Shirky was then invited to meet with Donald Trump, and he agreed to said meeting, which, I mean, since he's a Republican and also an extremist Republican, a lot of people, myself included, were worried that Trump would be able to convince him, which led to people protesting Mike Shirky when he arrived in D.C. because they thought, oh my God, is this actually happening? Are you going to be convinced to overturn the will of voters in Michigan? Take a look. Now, thankfully, Michigan certified the results of the election on Monday, so uh, Mike Shirky was not convinced to his credit. But the fact that people had a reason to be concerned, that shows you how fragile democracy is. And if we don't actually make institutional changes, a coup is possible in the near future, assuming the Republican Party continues to shift further and further to the right and openly embrace authoritarianism. I mean, it's not just Donald Trump. Remember that Lindsey Graham was trying to get entire counties in Georgia overturned. Now, not all Republicans are as authoritarian as Donald Trump, even though Brian Kemp successfully suppressed enough votes in Georgia to win his gubernatorial race. He still refused to just openly overturn the results of the election because you can't close Pandora's box once you open it. Like that is something entirely different. Like voter suppression is evil in and of itself, but to actually take it to the next step where the results are in and you overturn those results, we're just in straight up authoritarian territory. So because Trump's legal battle has failed because now he just, he can't win by appointing his own electors at the state level, it's over. And I think that you could argue that Trump's coup attempt really started to unravel once Trump's lawyers proved to people that they are not serious individuals. So Rudy Giuliani and Sidney Powell, they put on a press conference that I think can only be described as batshit fucking insane, where for whatever reason, Rudy Giuliani was secreting black liquid and um, Sidney Powell claimed that millions of votes were switched from Trump to Biden and of course presented no evidence. But the problem is that they got too crazy to the point where they were undermining their own argument, even if their original argument was uh, not factual and it was just laughable. So think about how far away they strayed from their original claim. They originally started out by claiming that the mail-in ballots was the Democrats' way of rigging this election. That was the, cat the catalyst. That's where they're going to be committing fraud. But then they moved the goalpost so much to where Sidney Powell publicly is saying, actually, millions of votes were flipped. And this is also some coordinated conspiracy between Venezuela, Cuba, the Democrats, Bernie Sanders. I mean, it's just, it's so batshit insane that even Trump's lawyers like Rudy Giuliani thought that this was making them look bad, which is why Trump's team decided to distance themselves from Sidney Powell after that press conference. In other words, they fired her. She's not a part of Trump's legal team, which caused a lot of chaos and confusion within MAGA cultist circles because they're wondering, wait, she is the most firebrand, most loyal individual, so why would Trump want to distance himself from her? Well, it's because you can only be so crazy 
to where you're left out of the room. And that's where we were getting. I mean, it was bad enough that Rudy Giuliani was getting laughed out of courts across the country. And it was already laughable. But they took it to the next level. Like, you have to dial down the craziness. Otherwise, you're going to look even more dumb than you already do. Now, in terms of why they distanced themselves from Sidney Powell, I'm going to let Rudy, Rudy Giuliani uh, explain why they decided to do this, because I think his explanation is very telling. The, the question I've got is, now we're, we're, we've been watching you pursue both uh, electoral fraud through the mail-in ballots, uh, electoral fraud as well through the software and the claims about Dominion a break with Sidney Powell over the weekend. What's behind that and uh, what is the motive, uh, the, the reason uh, for the split between uh, Powell and uh, Giuliani at all? Well, I think it's because we're pursuing two different theories. Our, uh, our theory of the case to get to the Supreme Court now in four places, and it's soon going to be in two others and there'll be an overall lawsuit, is uh, basically uh, misconduct of the election by state officials in at least five or six different states in which the misconduct of the election involved deprivation of constitutional rights for the president. So in other words, uh, Sidney Powell was let go because she's even too crazy for someone like me. I am a ghoul who literally secretes black fluid from my skull and I'm worried that she is going to make us look bad. <laughs> if if you're too crazy for someone like Rudy Giuliani, that's a problem. And even Donald Trump uh, reportedly was worried that his lawyers are just too crazy. Like they're going to make him look bad and undermine his effort. Like he worked so hard to lie about mail-in ballots. And now they're like taking it to the next level where they're saying, no, 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 it's not just mail-in ballots. Like votes are literally being flipped. Okay. Show us evidence. Even Tucker Carlson asked for evidence. Now, he has since done a 180, but nonetheless, when you have the biggest propagandists for the Republican Party questioning your narrative and not towing the party line, when you have more and more Senate Republicans break from Donald Trump because they can't possibly maintain this insane facade any longer, it's over. The best move for Trump is to understand he's run out of options and he's running out of time. And the best thing that he can do now is save face and possibly prep for 2024. So this is a concession. Like, I think that that is the only way to characterize this. For Donald Trump to go ahead and initiate this process, give Emily Murphy the go-ahead, that is a concession. It's over. This is him publicly admitting defeat in a very cowardly way, but nonetheless, it's still defeat. So I think it's important. But still, the extent to which he tried to steal this election in a number of ways... It should scare everyone because Donald Trump isn't as unique as people want to believe. Like, sure, he is a unique threat to democracy because he's so brazen. But the Republican Party throughout this process, they showed their cards. Lindsey Graham, again, tried to meddle to get entire counties invalidated. Trump's legal team has been arguing to basically invalidate the votes of millions of black voters in Detroit, in cities across the country that went for Biden. This is insane and brazen. And if they're this brazen now, I mean, they're not going to change in the future. So, look, I'm glad that Trump conceded. Uh, you know, it, it's a little bit of a relief that he now knows that he can't steal this election because that means that there will, in fact, be a transition of power. I didn't necessarily think that the odds of him succeeding in this coup would be successful, but still the fact that he's attempting it and he's trying to find any way to steal this election, that was deeply unsettling. Anyone who's worried about democracy or cares about democracy should have been watching this worried about the results because, you know, democracy, it's fragile and every single democracy, it does have an expiration date. And the question was whether or not our democracy would die now or if it still has a little bit life left in it or can possibly be saved. So um, it's over for Donald Trump, but uh, trust me, the Republican Party is not suddenly going to have this coming to Jesus moment uh, once he's out of office and out of power. He'll still have influence over the Republican Party and the shift to the right that he has facilitated within the Republican Party, 
that will continue. The Trump legacy is going to be a pretty long-lasting legacy, if not politically, then at least judicially, since he stacked the courts with, you know, Federalist Society goons. So, you know, um, now we move on to the next chapter, and we just hope that he doesn't cause that much damage before leaving office. Hopefully he won't start a war with Iran or fuck up too much stuff. We know he's going to be insufferable, but so long as, you know, he doesn't do too much to ruin the country. That would be great. But of course, we are not going to be able to sleep until he's out. And then we have to fight Biden. So it's just, it's it's a never-ending battle. Uh, but nonetheless, at least we can uh, check off coup from things we have to worry about now. And I just hit my microphone. So we'll end that there. So it kind of appears as if there are some rifts starting to form within the Republican Party, and this is all over Donald Trump's claim of election fraud and that the election was stolen from him by Democrats. Um, now you have establishment-oriented Republicans who are kind of just biting their tongues. They know that Donald Trump is a psychopath, but they don't want to say anything to criticize Donald Trump because they know that, you know, the heart and soul of the Republican Party the base, it lies with Donald Trump. So if they say something, they risk alienating their own base. Um, and then you have individuals who do embrace Donald Trump, the Kelly Loeflers and Marjorie Taylor Greens of the world who are part of this MAGA cult. And so what you see are two different factions within the Republican Party. So the question is, will this end up leading to intra-party warfare comparable to the warfare that we see on the Democratic Party side, where you see the Democratic Party establishment fight against the progressive left? And, you know, there's a lot of implications about this, but first of all, I want to show you what some MAGA chuds are saying with regard to the Republican Party's response to Trump's voter fraud claims. Because outside of the, uh, I believe, Georgia legislator, you had some Trump supporters uh, lashing out at Republicans like the uh, governor of Georgia, Brian Kemp, or Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, because they're not playing ball with Donald Trump when he cries fraud. Now, when I say they're not playing ball, what I mean in actuality is that they're not allowing Trump to just outright steal the election. Uh, so they don't like that, uh, and they're not accepting anything but a Trump victory. So listen to what they say, at least one Trump supporter says, and the response from the crowd when he says, uh, you better play ball with us, help Donald Trump, or we will destroy you. Take a look. And if Republican traitors like Kemp are not willing to show up for us, and Mitt Romney, and Mitt Romney, and the rest of them, then we will not be willing to show up for them. Yeah. 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 Brian Kemp is a traitor. Yeah. Yeah. Where's Governor Abrams? Abrams? Brad Raffensperger is a traitor. Yeah. 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 Any Republican that allows this to happen is complicit and we will finish you enemy yeah. death to tyrants do they think that we're just going to go away no stop the steal for any republicans not explicitly helping trump to stop this deal we will make sure you are never elected ever again yeah. Yeah. to the republicans that are easily bullied into compliance by the left we will Finish you. Yeah! We will end your career forever. We're the new GRB. If the Republican establishment stands back and stands by and allows this deal to go through, we will do whatever it takes to completely destroy the Republican Party. We the people! We will not accept mere investigations that go nowhere. We will not accept nothing less but a Donald Trump victory. Yeah! We will not accept fake audits and fake recounts like what's happening here in Georgia. We will accept nothing left but Donald Trump for another four years. Four more years! Four more years! Four more years! I mean, he lost, bro. What do you want him to do? What do you want Brian Kemp to do? Like, realistically speaking, what do you expect? I think we know what they expect. They want the results to be overturned in Georgia. Now, they uh, say that Republicans that did not show up for Trump were traitors who were complicit in some alleged scheme. Again, I mean, these folks, they just have to think about this 
longer than a minute or two and they'll see why their claims are ridiculous because when you have far-right Trump supporters like Marjorie Taylor Greene win her election in Georgia in a landslide, why would Democrats rig the presidential race but forget to rig the House and Senate races? Like, it doesn't make any sense, but they want loyalty. That's what they're saying. Um, and it's not just the Republican Party establishment uh, who they're pissed off by. Now, uh, they're mad at Fox News as well because they feel as if Fox News, by trying to pretend to be a serious news outlet, has betrayed them. And this MAGA chud is going to explain why he is outraged by Fox News and even Tucker Carlson. So we know there's a fraud. There's no question. And I don't know about you, but I was awfully disappointed yesterday with Tucker Carlson. Did yeah. anybody see that? Yeah. I mean, what the hell? We expect better. We do. And you know something? On election night, it was Fox News that first called Arizona prematurely for Biden. Compromise. It was Fox News that refused to carry President Trump's press conference two days after the election. And we expect that from the liberal media, of course. We expect that from CNN and MSNBC and every other network. Right, right. But we are the people that are watching Fox News, and they betrayed us. Yeah. And I'll tell you, I have been a fan of Tucker Carlson for a long time. Yeah. He has said things that a lot of people are afraid to say. Yeah. And he has given a voice to a variety of conservatism, which I think most people in the country agree with strongly. And after Fox News called Arizona prematurely for Joe Biden, I said, I will never watch Fox News again. Yep. Never. Yeah. I said, but maybe Tucker is okay. Right. But since the election, what has Tucker Carlson been talking about? Where are you? The day after the election, he was talking about how the polls are really fake. Really? The polls are fake? We've known that for five years. Right. We've known that for decades. The polls are fake. The polls are fake. The ballots are fake. Yep. Yeah. And the ballots True. are what decides the election. Yeah. Why don't you talk about that? Yeah. True. Yeah. And last week, he's talking about how, well, the Democrats didn't fare so well because defund the police isn't good political messaging talking about the political messaging of the left we're in the fight of our lives so they are genuinely unhinged and this is worrying um now there's this question of how long will this rift last like is this going to lead to a greater rift within the republican party and i think that's a possibility uh, or a likelihood, actually, at this point, will this be great for the Democratic Party? Because, you know, you see Republicans and their base not showing up to support them at the polls. What can we expect for this? And even though at face value, it might seem as if this is good for the left and Democrats, in actuality, I worry that this will facilitate another shift to the right for the Republican Party, if you can even imagine that. Because we saw what happened when a rift emerged within the Republican Party in the early 2010s with the Tea Party movement. And it wasn't as if that rift lasted for a while. I mean, sure, they primaried a couple of Republican establishment figures successfully, but ultimately the Republican Party ended up co-opting and absorbing the Tea Party. And now the Republican Party looks like the Tea Party. They are part of the Republican Party's base. And sure, the overall Tea Party message has been watered down a little bit, but they are one cohesive unit. So the thing that worries me about this rift is that, you know, Republicans, they're not going to be like the Democratic Party establishment and try to, you know, isolate and delegitimize and marginalize the MAGA chuds and MAGA cultists. My fear is that they're going to embrace the MAGA chuds and more and more the party is going to look like Donald Trump. I mean, it already kind of does where you have individuals like Lindsey Graham openly trying to invalidate the result the results of elections in certain counties cancel millions potentially of votes this is different than just them trying to suppress the vote that in and of itself is scandalous but now there are some republicans openly calling for the cancellation of votes following trump's lead so i don't necessarily think that this rift that we're seeing is going to lead to, you know, this clash between the Republican establishment and MAGA chuds. I think that what we're going to see 
is the Republican Party bend to the will of the Trump cultists? Because unlike the Democratic Party establishment, the Republican Party establishment is horrified of their base. They are always trying to appease their base, throwing more red meat to the base, being more extreme to appease their xenophobic and racist base. So when you have a lot of MAGA chuds who seemingly want the Republican Party to shift even 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 further to the right, I mean, I, I can't help but worry about what's to come. Now, you know, that MAGA chud in that video we talked about, he was outraged at Tucker Carlson for daring to ask Sidney Powell for evidence that millions of votes were switched. But what did Tucker Carlson ultimately do? He did a 180. He backtracked and claimed that the election was rigged days later. Yeah. So do we honestly just expect the Republicans to let this rift form and let it cause them to lose elections? Do we believe that Fox News is all of a sudden going to lose ground to Newsmax and OAN, who's going to cater more to Trump supporters? No. We've seen these types of rifts in the Republican Party emerge before, and we've seen how it played out. The Tea Party is one of many examples. Think of the NRA. When gun owners of America started to, you know, encroach on the NRA's territory and siphon off some of their memberships and attack NRA, what happened? Well, the NRA, they took a more hardline approach to gun regulations and any and all regulations were all of a sudden off the table because they felt that pressure from gun owners of America. And that's how they kept their hegemony, you know, in this sphere of politics. And I think the same is going to happen with Fox News. Like a lot of people are thinking, well, at least Fox News is going to be discredited now since, you know, Trump supporters are mad at them. I don't think that's going to be the case. I think they're going to become more like OAN and Newsmax. Like, I think that there is a higher likelihood that the MAGA chuds can remake the Republican Party and, you know, Republican adjacent organizations such as Fox News in their image quicker than the left can remake the Democratic Party in their own image. And that should worry everyone, because what does that mean if MAGA chuds get their way and they win this civil war pretty easily, which I think is possible? I mean, we see a more far-right Republican Party. The Republicans from 10 years ago look completely different than the MAGA chuds we see today. I mean, compare Sarah Palin to Marjorie Taylor Greene. Remember when we all thought that Sarah Palin was like, appalling the fact that the Republican Party could produce someone as crazy as this. Now you look to Sarah Palin and she looks like a moderate compared to Marjorie Taylor Greene or Kelly Loeffler. So the party is going to continue shifting right because that's where the base is. Whereas the Democratic Party, they don't really care about what their base wants because they know that you know Republicans are so bad, you're going to support them no matter what. So, you know, I'm not necessarily optimistic that this rift is going to hurt the Republican Party. I'd love for that to be the case, but I don't think that's going to be what happens. I think ultimately this will make the Republican Party overall more crazy as they absorb the Trump cultists and try to, you know, um, I don't know, if not placate them, then outright embrace their ideas. And, you know, that's why we're not seeing many Republicans speak up and admit the obvious that Joe Biden won this election, or at least it took them a while because they don't want to offend the Trump supporters because Trump has a very high approval rating within the Republican Party. Again, he has the heart and soul of the Republican Party's base. So, you know, I would love, 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 love to see a split in the Republican Party. But I, I just think that the Republican Party is more savvy than Democrats and they won't allow this to happen and they'll find some way to accommodate the Trump cultists. Which means that, you know, if Republicans ship further to the right, Democrats will likely follow them to the right because that's what Democrats have been doing for decades now. So, you know, I'm worried. I hope that I'm wrong. But I fear that this ultimately is going to have a negative impact um, on the country if MAGA chuds do remake the Republican Party in their image. They'll be more extreme if you could even imagine that. Congresswoman-elect and QAnon conspiracy theorist Marjorie Taylor Greene from Georgia went on Newsmax TV to explain to viewers with a straight face, mind you, why she believes it's the case that Democrats managed to rig the election in Georgia against Donald Trump, but somehow forgot to rig the election against her and her Democratic opponent. Now, when she makes this argument, she's going to contradict herself in less than one minute. And I mean, this is just comical to me. So we'll take a look and then I have another clip to show you after this. Uh, so did you have an opportunity at all to listen to the news conference earlier from uh, the president's attorneys there and some of the things they're questioning? They mentioned specifically with Georgia, where all of these votes seem to be being discovered, that they expect to file a lawsuit in Georgia tomorrow. 
They, they definitely should file a lawsuit. I want to tell you right now, Georgia voters have lost complete confidence in our Secretary of State, Brad Raffensperger. We've lost confidence in the Dominion voting machines, and we've lost com confidence in our elections. And this is an important time. We know for a fact that President Trump won Georgia. We do not believe Joe Biden won our state. We are not a blue state. Um, and we want our election secure going into our very important sent off runoff races on January 5th. Uh, Marjorie, do you believe that you were fairly elected, that, that that part, or do you feel like you are kind of in with all of this that was uh, unfair in some way? I, I know that um, I'm fairly elected. I live in a very strong Republican district. It's uh, R plus 27. So I have great confidence in, in my election, given mm -hmm. the fact that my district is such a strong Republican district. But what I do know um, in Georgia, my state as a whole, we have, we have a lot of counties that need to be completely looked at. We have 159 counties in our state. And when we're picking up 2,600 um, uh, brand new votes, uh, just in my county alone, in Floyd County, in my district, and we're picking up votes in other counties, we know we need to look at every single county in Georgia. But the real issue here is, look at these Dominion voting systems. They have ties to countries like Venezuela. They keep their servers where? Over in companies like Germany and Spain. You know, the real issue is something that President Trump brought forward, is we need to put America first. And that includes our elections, including the servers, that contain important information um, from voters in our elections. And, and that's something that I would like to bring up. <laughs> now, I hate to be redundant, but I've got to read what she said back to you. She says, Georgia voters have lost complete confidence in our Secretary of State, Brad Raffensperger. We've lost confidence in the, Demo in the Dominion voting machines, and we've lost confidence in our elections. Then literally seconds later, she says, I have great confidence in my election. So Democrats rigged the election against Donald Trump, but not you. Why would they forget that? I mean, you are pretty out there, right? You think that if they're going to rig any elections, they wouldn't want to forget your election. But, you know, people in Georgia, they don't have any faith in the Dominion voting machines, uh, in Brad Raffensperger, the Secretary of State, when it comes to the presidential race. But when it comes to your race, they have great confidence in the Dominion voting machines and Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger. Why would this be the case? Like, you only have to think about this for a few seconds to understand how ridiculous it is. Uh, why would Democrats not rig the House and Senate elections, but only rig the presidential race? That makes no sense. If they're going to do any rigging whatsoever, you'd think they'd go all out, right? But she she has no facts, no no evidence, not even basic logic. What she says here is nonsensical. Um, and <laughs> on top of that, I have to get to something else she said in a different interview with Newsmax because she echoed the same sentiment uh, about the election being rigged, but she said something else that was really peculiar to me. Well, I think, I think a lot of Georgia voters are not confident in our elections right now, and I'm very happy Governor Kemp has, has made those calls to audit the signatures and for, and, you know, basically backing President Trump for the recount. I think we need to go further. I really want to see the state legislators come together with a special session. I want to see the loophole closed to stop Democrat activists from all over the country from moving to Georgia um, and, and trying to vote in our very important Senate runoffs. Now, if it sounded to you like she basically said, I want to stop Democrats from moving to Georgia so that way they can't vote here. Um, that is exactly what she's saying. She says, I want to see the loophole closed to stop Democrat activists from all over the country from moving to Georgia and vote in our very important Senate runoff. What loophole is she referring to? Now, I, I did some research and I don't know exactly what legal loophole she's referring to, but the only thing that I could find is the loophole being that uh, registration ends on December 7th. So if you are someone who's moving to Georgia, you can still register to vote in this upcoming Senate runoff by December 7th. So the fact that someone who just moved to Georgia being able to register to vote until December 7th, that is what I'm assuming is the loophole she's referring to. But in terms of the evidence that there's this huge wave of Democrats moving to Georgia to tip the scales in favor of Democrats, 
I don't see it. But the only thing that I found was Andrew Yang, who tweeted out that he will be moving to Georgia to help Ossoff and Warnock win. And he didn't even say that he'd be voting for them. Uh, he just said that he would help campaign for them. Um, I hate to tell you this, but that's perfectly legal. That's perfectly legal. American citizens can move to other states. And guess what? Republicans can do the same thing. Republicans from Texas can move to Georgia to help Purdue and Loeffler win. So, I mean, what do you what do you propose the solution be to this problem? Should we ban Democrats from moving to Georgia? I don't know what the expectation is. It seems like you just want to complain that Democrats or one Democrat, Andrew Yang, is moving to Georgia to help influence this election. I don't know if he's going to canvas or whatever, but that's that's legal. This is one country with different states and we can move around. I don't know how many people are actually going to want to base their residency on one single election. But nonetheless, if people want to do that, they can do that. Democrats can do that. Republicans can do that. What do you expect? This doesn't mean that there is evidence that Democrats are rigging this election. This just means that Andrew Yang really cares about these two runoff races. So, I mean, everything she says, it has no evidence. It's all just, you know, uh, conjecture, conspiracy theories. Um, and to really even call it theories at this point, it, that gives it too much credit because she's just like vomiting out words that don't have any connection to reality. This woman is untethered to reality. And she talks about, you know, Dominion voting machines. And it's funny because all you have to do is a quick 30 second Google search and you'll see that most of the things Republicans have said about them are laughably stupid. So I've seen some boomer memes, sh memes shared on Facebook where basically they share this logo that looks super nefarious that says Dominion, <laughs> changing the way people vote. And as you can see, a red ballot goes in, a blue ballot comes out and they make it seem as if this is super nefarious. But if you go to their website and look at their actual logo, that isn't their logo. That's literally fake news. And I almost forgot to mention, in that first video, she brought up Venezuela and that Dominion, a company based in Denver, Colorado, has uh, ties to Venezuela. I mean, the things that she is saying are fucking stupid. They're fucking stupid. And look, here's the thing. We can find some common ground here, Marjorie. How about this? I also agree that maybe we shouldn't have private companies uh, tabulate the voting results. So why don't you and I propose that we nationalize Dominion? Well, she wouldn't support that because then that would be socialism and socialism bad. And for individuals like Marjorie Taylor Greene and anyone who follows her who are actually concerned that the election is fraudulent, you can actually audit this election yourself. You can go to your county and ask to audit this election. Everyone can do that. We have the ability to do that. But you don't want to do that because you're just too lazy. It's easier to listen to what Donald Trump tells you to do and just, you know, take him at his word while not actually taking the time to either research things yourself or add, audit the election results in your county. So, I mean, this is why, you know, America is in this uh, sad state of affairs because we are in this post-factual era where nobody can even agree on what's in front of us. Empirical reality, like that doesn't bode well for the long-term health of our country if we have people who are basically delusional. So people like Marjorie Taylor Greene aren't helping, but I'm not going to lie. She is quickly becoming one of my favorite members of Congress because um, this is a train wreck that I am not going to want to look away from. Uh, she is, uh, she's out there. <laughs> and it, it's really interesting to see how the Republican Party establishment responds to her. But if I had to guess, they're probably going to embrace her. I mean, you'll see people like Mitt Romney shun her. But in terms of like the aggregate Republican Party, she's going to be a rising star because the crazier you are, the faster you move up the ranks in the Republican Party. Trump became president. So uh, this type of politics is popular among the MAGA base. So, yeah, great. Corrupt Republican Kelly Loeffler in Georgia is currently competing for a U.S. Senate seat, and she really should be in prison. She shouldn't be running for president after we just found out that she was doing insider trading this year, sold her stocks after she was briefed on the coronavirus. But nonetheless, she's still running. But I want to look at her campaign strategy because it's really interesting to me. The way that she is criticizing her opponent, Raphael Warnock, is by trying to tie him to members of the squad and claim that 
this individual is an extremist. Now, Reverend Raphael Warnock is nothing like any of the members of the squad, unfortunately. He's just a milquetoast centrist Democrat. He doesn't even support Medicare for All, and he's a reverend who supposedly believes in Jesus. Because, you know, of course, Jesus supported access to affordable health care. But I digress. She is trying to attack him by comparing him to the squad. So she tweeted this out. It's no wonder the squad fully supports Reverend Warnock. He totally supports their dangerous and extreme agenda, I wish. And Ilhan Omar completely agrees with his disgraceful comments about our active service members, veterans, and their families. Now, the article that she links to is completely fucking stupid because it's apparently a scandal that in 2011, in a sermon, Reverend Warnock said that nobody can serve God and the military at the same time. And none of this is relevant because God is not real. He's not. There's no evidence that God exists, so it's not going to be relevant what somebody says about God for this U.S. Senate seat and this race in general. Uh, but furthermore, if you are going to self-identify as someone who is religious, if you're pro-life, as Kelly Loeffler is, I'm assuming, then you might want to tone down the worship of our military and U.S. militarism and militarism in general. But nonetheless, uh, this is supposedly a scandal. Like, I don't get why this is so controversial. But nonetheless, Ilhan Omar, you know, she doesn't support Reverend Warnock because he's quote-unquote extreme. She supports him because he's not Kelly Loeffler. She is a literal criminal who should be in prison because, again, she was caught doing insider trading. But instead of being punished, she is running for a United States Senate seat. Now, Ilhan responded, pointing this out, saying blatant lies from the disastrous insider trading QAnon conspiracy supporting fear mongering appointed Kelly. Pro tip to win an election, you run on ideas, debate your actual opponent and defend your record, not run against the squad. Ask Trump. He fucked around and found out. Now, I love that response from her. And uh, when she says QAnon conspiracy supporting, basically, uh, the reason why she's pointing this out with regard to Kelly Loeffler isn't necessarily because Kelly Loeffler supports QAnon or believes in that, but she has embraced QAnon Congresswoman-elect Marjorie Taylor Greene. And Marjorie Taylor Greene is on the stump for her, which is someone who you want to distance yourself from if you want people to think that you're sane. Uh, but Kelly Loeffler responded basically by saying, um, no you when it comes to corruption. And she tweeted, Ilhan, we saw the video of you smiling and laughing while talking about Al-Qaeda and 9-11. We know that you funneled millions of dollars to your new husband's consulting firm. And we know that you're an unabashed anti-Semite. You should be expelled from Congress. Now, of course, none of this is true at all. Uh, when she says that Ilhan Omar was smiling and laughing, uh, talking about Al-Qaeda and 9-11, Ilhan Omar, I mean, we talked about this on the program, she was saying because some people did something, she doesn't want the entire community of Muslims in the world, which is more than a billion people, to be demonized and make it seem as if they, you know, supported the attacks on 9-11. We don't even have to get through all of this because, uh, you know, go, going through all of these attacks one by one, we know that this is a bad faith actor. She's an anti-Semite because she speaks up for Palestinian rights, right? And if she's an anti-Semite, Kelly, then you are an Islamophobe because you don't care about Palestinian rights. So Ilhan responded to this by basically brushing it aside saying, sorry, Kelly, if you need help writing a real clapback, I am here to help. This ain't it. Try harder. And I think that's really all that you can say because Kelly Loeffler is not a serious person. Again, this individual should be in prison. She should at least be fined, but she is running for a U.S. Senate seat, and yet she has the audacity to say that Ilhan Omar is the one who should be expelled from Congress. Why? What's the specific reason why you think that she should be expelled from Congress? You should not be allowed to run for the Senate after you have been busted insider trading. Like, this should be a bigger scandal than it is. But the fact that she is still there and her colleagues are there, like Dianne Feinstein and other senators who literally got caught doing insider trading, that should be outrageous to everyone. Uh, but that kind of ended between Kelly Loeffler and Ilhan Omar. And then out of the blue, uh, QAnon Congresswoman-elect herself, Marjorie Taylor Greene, decided to jump in and attack Ilhan Omar in the dumbest way imaginable, saying, back down Ilhan Omar, you married your brother, so you're... <laughs> So you're disqualified from running your mouth. Got her. Now, seeing that there is 
about a 60% or higher chance that Marjorie Taylor Greene fucked her cousin at least once. I don't think that she, of all people, should be uh, using this particular conspiracy theory about Ilhan Omar. I mean, there are other conspiracy theories that you can use, but she's using this one. Now, Ilhan Omar responded by saying, Looks like Crazy Lady has logged on. I know things might be different where you come from, but you have to get off of the loony train now <laughs> that you are in Congress. Marjorie then responded saying, Don't even get me started on where you come from. We don't marry our brothers here in America, so I'm not sure who you're calling crazy. And I love that she's just like so committed to this conspiracy theory that Ilhan Omar married her brother. Lady, <laughs> you believe in QAnon, so nothing that you believe is valid or legitimate. Like anything that you say should be dismissed because you said it. Like that's how crazy you are. But Ilhan Omar, she stopped responding at that point. But she did, however, retweet one of her colleagues who responded to Marjorie Taylor Greene in a way that was surprisingly savage. So Congressional Progressive Caucus co-chair Mark Pocon actually tweeted out, my new colleague is classless. I hope she decides to be more professional when she gets sworn in. So far, she's off to an awful start. You were elected to be a member of Congress, not a spokesperson for QAnon lunatics. Try growing the fuck up please yeah that's uh that pretty much says it all and you know in some ways i'm really i'm discouraged to see political discourse uh come to this where we're not necessarily debating policies or ideology and you have these dipshits like marjorie taylor green and kelly loeffler tweeting out conspiracy theories about Ilhan Omar that she married her fucking brother or supports 9-11 or laughed at 9-11. I mean, this is what we have to deal with. How are we supposed to, we being like anyone who's not a Republican, work with these types of people, unify with these types of people? There's just, there's no common ground. There's a disconnect there uh, between them and reality. So how do you find any areas of opportunity to work with individuals like this? who are just insane. Like Marjorie Taylor Greene, Kelly Loeffler, these are like your racist Facebook aunts that share boomer memes all the time about how Hillary Clinton like made a deal with the devil literally to like become the president or some shit. It just, it's a sad state of affairs when we have these types of Republicans coming to power because they are so insane that they make individuals like Sarah Palin, who was previously seen as the most crazy look relatively reasonable so it's a uh, it's a little disturbing but nonetheless i am gonna admit i do find it entertaining so there's that i guess so the other day representative alexandria ocasio cortez put out a tweet that i think is basically just common sense she says to get the virus under control we need to pay people to stay home yeah that's exactly what we need to do but for whatever reason, this was incredibly controversial. Republicans talked about this and attacked her for this as if it's so extreme to do what other countries are doing to get the virus under control, who have been more successful, mind you, at getting the virus under control. So one of the people who attacked her was uh, Nikki Haley, who tweeted out, AOC, are you suggesting you want to pay people to stay home from the money you take by defunding the police? Or was that for the student debt you wanted to pay off? The Green New Deal or Medicare for All? Hashtag, where is the money? Now, I mean, clearly she's a bad faith actor and she's going to try to find a way to interpret uh, AOC's tweet in the least charitable way imaginable. But what she ended up doing was revealing how stupid she is. What you just said proves that you don't know about the government that you worked for because AOC pointed out, Nikki, I'm suggesting Republicans find the spine to stand up to their corporate donors and vote for the same measures they did in March, except without the Wall Street bailout this time. And I know you're confused about actual governance, but police budgets are municipal, not federal. <laughs> utterly embarrassing that this woman was a governor and still doesn't have a grasp on public investment. Wonder if she says federal financing works like a piggy bank or household too. All this faux seriousness from folks who worship Trump for running the country like his casino. Damn. Just like that. <laughs> AOC dismantled her entire political career. If you want to attack AOC, you're free to do that. You can criticize her. But they're not even trying to present themselves as serious people. And I think that she knows that her base probably won't 
notice the distinction because you just want to attack AOC for being extreme, for calling for the police to be defunded, whatever. But you look like a stupid person when you say things like this. When you don't even express that you have a basic grasp of the way that our federalist system works. I mean, saying that she wants to defund the police to pay for Medicare for all, it makes you sound like a fucking stupid person. It just does. Like, I don't mean to be crass, but you want to run for president. Like, I'm assuming you want to run for president. You were a governor. You were within Trump's administration as UN ambassador. You want to run for president one day, and this is the best that you've got? See, they can't come up with an argument to actually rebut what AOC is saying. So what do they do? They try to use this straw man and claim as if, you know, she is ridiculous. They use buzzwords like socialism and Venezuela and communism and yada, yada, yada. And all they do is make themselves look fucking idiotic. Imagine a situation where it's 2024 and AOC is the Democratic Party nominee and Nikki Haley is the Republican Party nominee. Could you imagine how a debate would go? Nikki Haley has proven that she is an idiot. And I don't even, like, I'm not convinced she believes what she's saying here. Like, I think she knows what AOC is trying to say. I think that she's aware of the fact that municipal budgets can't be used to fund federal programs. But nonetheless, you know, she she likes to try to find ways to criticize the left but, you know, she presents herself as the serious Republican when you're not a serious person if you don't even have a grasp of basic governance. And, you know, if you actually know the way that things work and the way that things are funded, then you probably shouldn't pretend that you don't because that makes you look stupid, not AOC. But I just had to share this because AOC, um, it's it's great to see her clap back at all of these politicians who try to attack her because they're clearly like they, they don't know how to respond to her. She is more intelligent than them, and she knows more about policy than they do. Or maybe they know a lot more than they let on, but they're just corporate stooges, and they don't actually care about, you know, working for the people, so they try to find ways to rationalize their their corporatism. I don't know what it is, but it doesn't matter. When you step up and you take a swing at AOC, you better make sure that you don't miss, because you end up looking like a fucking fool if you do. And that's exactly what happened to Nikki Haley. Embarrassing. So Kyle Rittenhouse, the teenager who went to Kenosha, Wisconsin, and ended up killing two people, he has been released. Now, this is old news by now, but I still wanted to talk about this because I think that I have to point out the absurdity of our so-called criminal justice system and how this is, this is just, it exposes everything wrong with our system. So CNN reports, Kenosha shooting suspect Kyle Rittenhouse posts 2 million bail. 2 million. And he posted that. Now, that in and of itself, the fact that he's being released when he's a domestic terrorist, literally, should disgust you. But what's even perhaps more disgusting is the fact that right-wingers celebrated this. As if he's a hero. He took two lives. Two human beings are dead because of him. They will never live again. And you're celebrating this? Now, whenever I talk about Kyle Rittenhouse and I call him a domestic terrorist, which he is, MAGA chuds will, will respond by saying, but Mike, he, he had to do that. He had to kill them because that was self-defense. No, you have no evidence of that. All you have are conspiracy theories. But what we know that is confirmed is that this individual is the aggressor. He showed up with a gun looking for problems. It's despicable. Now, I want to share some tweets from AOC because I think she made phenomenal points that should be common sense to everyone. She says, people who argue that dramatic changes to policing, including budgetary ones, will mean violent people will be let out of jail to roam free, rarely ever acknowledge that's actually the current system we have today for the privileged. Does anyone believe Rittenhouse would be released if he were Muslim and did the same thing in a different context? For people who say systemic racism doesn't exist, this is what it looks like. Protection of white supremacy baked deep into our carceral systems. Law and disorder. And that's exactly it. It. That is exactly it. I mean, think about how outrageous it is that 
police officers will respond to Black Lives Matter protesters, even peaceful ones, with violence, but individuals, armed thugs from militias, will show up with guns and they work with them. Who's actually violent? The people with the guns or the people with the signs? Now, sure, occasionally these protests turn into riots, but that violence is a response to state sanctioned violence. The violence in Minneapolis was a response to violence against George Floyd. The violence in Kenosha was a response to the shooting of Jacob Blake. But that violence is never justified and acceptable. Police violence is. This type of uh, militias who kill people, that's acceptable. Our criminal justice system is a fucking joke. I mean, it's already bad enough that we have a two-tier justice system where the rich get away scot-free no matter what types of crimes they commit. I mean, how many United States senators got busted doing insider trading this year and how many of them are in, pre in prison? Zero. But on top of that, we have a white supremacist system. We have a system where weed is virtually legal for white Americans, but black Americans get locked up for smoking it. It's just... <sighs> It's despicable, and, you know, I would encourage everyone who hasn't already to read Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow, because you will see how racist our system is in actuality. And, you know, the fact that this domestic terrorist is now going to be free, it's disgusting. It shows that this, <laughs> this country is uh, in really poor shape. The fact that there's disagreement about whether or not a domestic terrorist should be free is disturbing. So last week on the program, we talked about how Republicans and MAGA chuds, they were outraged because reasonable people dared to warn that as COVID cases surge, you might want to consider scaling back your Thanksgiving celebration so we don't spread COVID-19 to our loved ones. Uh, and of course, you know, the right, they uh, threw a tantrum over that. Charlie Kirk claimed that the left doesn't actually care about COVID and this is just our covert effort to destroy Thanksgiving, as if we don't also like to eat delicious food and hang out with our friends and family. Uh, on top of that, uh, you had other individuals such as Steven Crowder tweet out, as for me and my household, we will celebrate Thanksgiving. We will have a house full of family, friends, and kin. We will give thanks together, pray together, and make merry with grateful and joyous hearts. This is now rebellion. So in other words, let's kill grandma to own the libs. Very smart, very big brained Stephen Crowder. And I love how he's trying to make it seem as if like praying together with family and friends is rebellious. Motherfucker, if you were born 50 years earlier, you would be one of the people sounding the alarm about how rock and roll is devil worship and it's making teenagers more promiscuous or some bullshit like that. You are not someone who has a rebellious heart. You are a bootlicker. You are a quintessential bootlicker. So shut the fuck up. But I mean, like, this is what I expect from these sorts of right-wing ideologues. But when it comes to members of the United States Congress, you'd expect them to be at least a little bit more responsible. But unfortunately, that is uh, not what we got because Ted Cruz decided to tweet out, you want my turkey liberals? You better come and take it from me. I'm the only one who's going to be fucking this turkey. <laughs> I mean, eating this turkey. <laughs> So, I mean, it's funny because he, he's like trying to be this badass and he's like, come and get my turkey. Ted, you're not some defender of liberty. You literally tried to get dildos banned in Texas. Like, you don't even think that Americans deserve the liberty to fuck themselves. So don't pretend as if you are like this fighter for American values. Like, you're, you're a clown. You are a clown. And because it's Ted Cruz, and even though he tries so hard to make people like him, He's just so hateable. He has a punchable face. And as someone with a punchable face myself, I can actually say that, and I don't think it's controversial. Uh, but the internet responded as the internet responds to things that Ted Cruz says. I mean, they ruthlessly and hilariously clowned on him. Majority Report responded saying, 
good one, Ted. <laughs> and they shared this gif of him trying to dribble a basketball through his legs. I, I love this gif. Uh, you've got people pointing out the thousands of individuals lining up in Texas for food, which is his state. And you think that if he's worried about a war on Thanksgiving, I mean, I can't imagine anything worse than people literally going hungry on a holiday that he uh, wants to defend. So, I mean, maybe he should do something about that. Uh, you have another twist on the don't tread on me flag with patriotic choking noises, which is, you know, sad, but actually kind of accurate. You have folks memeing uh, his come and take it photo with a stretcher and a body bag uh, because that's what he's basically encouraging. I mean, we have some pretty good uh, Judge Judy and John Oliver memes. Somebody posted a photo of coronavirus saying, come get it. Uh, and then you <laughs> Yeah, this one, which made me laugh out loud. This meme saying, uh, weird hill to die on, but at least you're dead. <laughs> That's so ruthless. Uh, you have somebody making a reference to the porn that he liked on his public Twitter account when he didn't realize that he wasn't logged on to his throwaway account. And of course, you have more memes with uh, Come and Get It featuring coronavirus and pictures of Ted Cruz's face photoshopped on a turkey, which I have to admit made me laugh way harder than it should have probably. And this just goes on and on and on and on. And I feel like even though this is a serious issue, it's healthy for normal people, reasonable people to laugh at things like this because it really like when you sit back and you think about it, this really is depressing. Like Ted Cruz, it's not just one person saying this. It's not just sad because a member of the United States Senate is saying this. This type of mindset is widespread in the United States of America, where if you go to any local uh, news outlet posting, you know, just general statistics about COVID-19, you see all the comments. Where's the evidence? Hoax. Like, just batshit insane things. So, you know, it's nice to see people clown on stupid people. Uh, not necessarily because I think this is going to help move the needle, but because, you know, individuals in Congress, even though the bar is super low, we should at least expect them to try to, like, set a good example. But individuals like Ted Cruz, he's trying to position himself to be the next edgy outsider like Donald Trump. And so he does things like this. He makes these weird, cringeworthy tweets on Twitter where he tries to like make it seem as if he is this badass. And you're Ted Cruz. So that persona is never going to apply to you because you are Ted Cruz. You are a goober who ate a booger on national television during a televised debate. You're just, you're unlikable. And, you know, the worst part is you don't even have policies that benefit people's lives. If you were unlikable but had good policies, I'd give you a pass. But you're a dipshit and you have policies that would destroy the planet and the country. So whenever Ted Cruz gets dunked on, I'm going to be here for it because he deserves it. So we are going to have a really long and rough couple of months ahead when it comes to COVID-19. And as bad as it is now, it could get even worse. I mean, we are seeing almost 200,000 new cases per day. We've surpassed 250,000 deaths in the United States due to COVID-19. And even though the virus is spreading more and more, Americans are disregarding, you know, social distancing protocols. They are traveling in larger numbers for the holidays. And when governors take action and issue more lockdown orders, such as in Oregon, residents are defying said orders and they're protesting outside of the governor's residence. And on one hand, you know, it's easy to be angry at these folks for not wanting another lockdown. But at the same time, the federal government hasn't taken any action. So governors, they don't have the power of the purse that Congress has. So without another federal stimulus, if a governor locks down, which is the right thing to do to mitigate the spread of the virus, then you're just harming small businesses. So it's this really horrible situation that we find ourselves in where there's no federal money that states have to assist them with this lockdown. But you have to lock down, otherwise more people will catch the virus and die. But yet, more small businesses will go bankrupt, people will suffer. It's a disaster, and we're not even thinking right now about what's going to happen January 1st, when the moratorium on evictions expires. Is Trump, a lame duck president, going to want to reissue that? How many people are going to face eviction? How many more people will go hungry before the holiday season? Like, it's... It's genuinely depressing to think about all of this. And to make matters worse, you know, you have 
politicians like Congresswoman-elect Marjorie Taylor Greene irresponsibly post selfies of herself bragging about how they're not wearing masks in Georgia. Uh, we're still seeing the viral videos of Karens getting kicked out of Costco's for refusing to wear masks. And it just proves that people are incredibly selfish. Incredibly selfish. And not only that, that our government just doesn't care about us. The United States government, which is the richest country in the world, responded to this pandemic as you'd expect a failed state to respond to it. I mean, think about how insane it is that with all of the economic ruin that this pandemic has caused, Americans got one payment, just one, of $1,200. They expect Americans to survive on that. So, it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. Having said that, though, I do think that there is some room for optimism. We are starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel because we have two vaccines that are very effective. And on top of that, the University of Oxford found that AstraZeneca's vaccine is very effective at stopping someone from contracting COVID-19. And on top of that, the FDA has authorized Regeneron's antibody cocktail for emergency use on high-risk patients with mild to moderate symptoms. And the government is apparently subsidizing some of the treatments, so that way there's no out-of-pocket costs. I think that the devil is in the details there. But, you know, it's getting worse, but at the same time, we're starting to see a glimmer of hope with regard to vaccines and therapeutics. So the question is, you know, as it gets worse and we start to see, you know, uh, a cure basically in the form of, of a vaccine, how long is this going to go on for? I mean, everyone has quarantine fatigue, myself included. Nobody likes wearing masks. We just begrudgingly do it because we, we want to protect others. So how long until things start to get back to normal? And uh, there is some encouraging news with regard to when we might start to see some normality again as the pandemic goes away uh but there's a lot of caveats so according to one vaccine expert it could be as early as may of next year that things could get back to normal meaning we could actually have a relatively normal summer so as the guardians joanna walters explains as the number of covid 19 cases in the united states passed 12 million the trump administration's vaccine program advisor predicted that life in america could be back to normal around may of 2021 as immunization is set to begin the note of optimism came even as millions of americans were expected to travel for the upcoming thanksgiving holiday this week and many appeared to be ignoring warnings from health officials about furthering the spread of the infectious disease. Monsef Slaoui, chief scientific advisor of the government's Operation Warp Speed vaccine development and distribution program, which involves the military and the private sector, as well as government health experts, said that pending regulatory approval for the first vaccine means that first Americans could be vaccinated outside of clinical trial by mid-December. And Slaoui said that if the vaccination distribution and immunization plan goes well, enough Americans should be vaccinated by May or or something like that, of 2021 to allow life to go back to normal. The first application to the U.S. government for vaccine approval was made on Friday by the pharmaceutical team of Pfizer and its partner, BioNTech. The Food and Drug Administration regulatory body is scheduled to hold a key meeting on December 10th that could award the team emergency authorization for the vaccine. By December 11th or 12th, I'm hopeful the first people will be immunized across the United States in all states, Slaoui told CNN's State of the Union politics show on Sunday morning. Morning. The administration plans to vaccinate 20 million people in December and another 30 million per month thereafter. Healthcare workers and the most vulnerable populations, such as residents of nursing homes, are expected to be the first in line. Slawi said that with the first vaccines, the U.S. pharmaceutical firm Moderna is expected to apply for regulatory authorization soon on its vaccine, need to be given to at least 70% of the U.S. population for true herd immunity to take place. So if he's right, and you know, we could have 70% of the population vaccinated by May. This is this is really good news. Um, I will admit, though, you know, uh, I'm not that optimistic and there's a million different caveats. And when Dr. Fauci was asked about this timeline, he was a little bit more skeptical because the next task that we're going to have as a country is getting people to take vaccines. Because as we know, there's been increasing anti-vax sentiment in this country. Although when it comes to COVID-19, it doesn't seem to be as prevalent 
as normal vaccines, and Gallup shows that support for a COVID-19 vaccination is at 58%, meaning that 58% of Americans would take a vaccine. And when you control for party affiliation, unsurprisingly, more Democrats would take the vaccine than Republicans. So if it is the case that 58% of Americans in total take this vaccine, uh, you know, when you factor in that, as well as all of the people who have antibody responses generated from having COVID-19, we could be close to 70% to reach herd immunity. But it's going to be tough uh, to convince people because Joe Biden will be president and Trump supporters will be more conspiratorial and think that it's unsafe. It's going to be, I think, a really huge struggle. So I I'm kind of more in line with what Dr. Fauci says in that it's probably a little bit too optimistic to think May is when things are going to return to normal. But to me, I take this as sometime in 2021, things will return to normal, most likely. Um, now, there's there's some reason to want Donald Trump to take credit for the vaccine, at least some credit for the vaccine. Because if Donald Trump doesn't give it his stamp of approval, will his supporters take it? We need people to take the vaccine in order to have herd immunity, in order to protect ourselves and the world from the virus. So just getting people to take this vaccine is going to be tough in and of itself. Now, the good news is that if a lot of people don't want to take it immediately, uh, you know, others will have access to the vaccine, assuming it's affordable uh, or <laughs> accessible at all. Who knows? That's a different story for a different day uh, or discussion for a different day, I should say. But I mean, look... We're going to have to wait and see. But, um, you know, there there is, I think, cause for optimism. There's a glimmer of hope. We're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel just a little bit. But to get to that point where we see, you know, a more normal country and world again, what we have to go through to get there is going to be tough. We still have to take precautions. And, I mean, given how Americans have responded, they're probably going to celebrate Thanksgiving, a lot of people at least as if there isn't a pandemic, which is worrisome because, you know, it's not like these celebrations, you know, will occur in a vacuum. Society doesn't exist in a vacuum. So if you, you know, uh, travel and you see your family and you contract COVID-19, you could give that to others, your grocery store clerks and whatnot. So it's just, it's exhausting. Um, and this is just, it's going to take a long time, but I think that if there's some cause for optimism, we should try to hang on to that because it's going to be a really, really rough couple of months. So last week on the program, we talked about a gut-wrenching story from South Dakota where a nurse who is caring for COVID-19 patients describes how they are in denial of the virus as they literally die from it because they believe Donald Trump's lies. They believe that this is a hoax and that what they're experiencing, the, the illness that they feel, it's not from the virus. It's from something else. Now, another story uh, has emerged featuring another nurse who's working on the front lines, caring for COVID-19 patients. And what she says is genuinely just heartbreaking. And I wanted to share her story because I think that these, these types of uh, stories from nurses are really important. So she writes, I am tired. I spent the last eight months caring for COVID patients. I've missed my family and friends. I've missed birthdays and my own wedding anniversary. I've coded nurses and doctors who worked in the same hospital as I when they contracted coronavirus. I kept going. I believed my country needed my skills to save American lives, so I dropped everything and flew to New York. I've worked in South Jersey, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Chester, Pennsylvania, and now I'm back in Texas. We were making gains. The numbers were dropping. The curve was flattening. I was able to leave the COVID ICU. I was assigned to a non-COVID floor. I was finally able to go home. My toddler has stopped crying every time I leave the room because she was scared I wasn't coming back. It's heartbreaking to watch a happy child get sad because she thinks her mama is leaving again. Children don't understand their parents being gone for months at a time. We were finally settling in and getting back out to the new normal. But then Donald Trump and his followers started this anti-mask bullshit. Now our numbers are climbing again. Actually, they are worse in my hospital than the first wave. I'm going back to the COVID unit. I'm going back to a small, cold, one-bedroom apartment and leaving my home. I'm going back to an uncertain future. Future. I'm going back, except now I'm losing hope. 
The worst part of it all is my little one. She is so happy that her mama is home. Now I have to leave again. I dread the holidays. Not one of these selfish anti-maskers is going to care that I'll spend my holidays alone so they can be assholes and not wear masks. They don't have to see my child's tears. They wouldn't care anyway. She won't get to eat my sweet potato pie on Friendship and Fellowship Day. This will be the first year that she's excited about our tree and the gifts under it. I'm going to miss it all. This is what I have to give up so these horribly selfish people can go to their grandma's house and infect her with covid then they'll bring her to my hospital they're not kind they are entitled assholes who think someone else got grandma sick they're the ones that will follow you to another patient's room to tell you their grandmother is more important than the patient you're going to see they're the ones that will take off their air vote to blame china for the china virus they're the ones that call me girl they tell me how admirable it is that i speak good english and manage to overcome to get a college degree they are racist covidiots and they refuse to acknowledge the harm they cause i deserve a break i deserve to watch my baby open her gifts on christmas i deserve to work without fear that today might be the day i contract coronavirus i am fucking tired now hearing this story it like the last story it brought tears to my eyes because you know in the last story you know the the south dakota nurse talked about how painful it is to see you know, uh, patients who she cares for in denial. But this story, it really, it gives you the perspective of a nurse. And this just reinforces the reality that when this is all said and done, these nurses are going to have PTSD. They're going to have decades of trauma from this experience. They're putting everything on the line, sacrificing their own lives to care for people in a country that don't seem to take the virus seriously. I mean, most people do, but a large enough portion of American society just doesn't seem to care or take it seriously, thinks it's a joke. And that anyone who is taking it seriously is, you know, being too alarmist. And then, you know, this is the cost. It's taking a toll on the personal lives of nurses and doctors who have to give up everything to fight and they're putting their lives at risk. I mean, this, this to me, it might have hit me harder than the other story with the South Dakota nurse because, I mean, even though that's sad as well, this really just shows you that this is not an easy job. I mean, the trauma that they're experiencing is comparable to veterans of war. Like, what they're seeing, they're seeing their colleagues die. They're caring for patients that are saying racist things to them. It's just... It's so sad and devastating, and I've said this before, but I don't think we're truly going to grasp the, the scale of devastation from this virus until decades later. I mean, when there's something like 9-11, which is a singular event where 3,000 Americans die, you know, you, you can easily reflect on that because it's just this one sudden shock. But, you know, the thing about these types of pandemics is the devastation occurs at a more gradual rate. It's like, you know, the frog that you throw into a boiling pot. If he feels that heat, he's going to jump out immediately. But if you throw a frog into a pot and then you gradually turn up the temperature, he's going to get accustomed to it. And that's what I think is happening with COVID-19. Like as the numbers tick up, as we reach more than a quarter million deaths, people tune out. Like the number just is too big for our minds to fathom psychologically. So I think maybe there's you know, some form of protection that we're imposing on ourselves by putting up this wall, or maybe we're just growing numb to it. Either way, people who are fighting this virus firsthand, like this nurse, she doesn't get to be numb to it. She sees it every single day. So it's super convenient that individuals like you and I can just like try to tune it out, try to stay home in quarantine and play video games and distract ourselves. But folks like this, they don't, they don't have that luxury. And their families are suffering for this because they're choosing to fight this virus and save lives. And what do they get in return? Nothing. And like this hits close to home because I have friends and family members in healthcare who are working with COVID patients. And, you know, when I hear stories that, you know, they're, they're putting their lives at risk and getting exposed to the virus, it's, it's horrifying. You know, we're starting to see a light at the end of the tunnel because... You know, we're having multiple vaccines show to be pretty effective, highly effective even. But how much devastation 
will we see before getting to that point? I mean, how many more people are going to die who are alive today who haven't yet been infected? It's just, it's horrifying to think about. So I think that these stories are important. Like, I don't believe we should look away from this. I think we have to face this and we have to do something about this. Nurses and frontline workers are going to be absolutely traumatized for decades and we have to take care of them. We can't just abandon them. But we live in this cold, late-stage capitalist society where, you know, we don't look out for our own. So this was uh, the sit close to home. And, uh, you know, this thread was was really informative. Um, you know, we, we oftentimes, if we're not in this position, don't have to think about it. But when we hear from these folks, man, is this uh, is this horrifying? Well, that's everything. I don't think I have anything left to say. I, I said everything that was on my heart. So <laughs> uh, if you'd like to support the show, uh, you can do so by going to humanistreport.com slash support, patreon.com slash humanistreport, or by clicking join underneath any one of our YouTube videos. Uh, but we have to thank the individuals who make the show possible, who help us not just to survive, but thrive as well. You all are truly incredible people, and I, I really value your patronage. And even if you, you can't afford to watch or to support the show monetarily again just watching it truly it really does make a difference so as long as you are a consistent viewer you're helping the show honestly so that's all that i've got as we go into the holiday season season i look forward to uh transitioning to discussing the war on christmas uh because trump will be out biden will be in so i hope that the right talks about that because this is one of my favorite subjects uh so if they do then I've got you covered. But anyways, I'm going to bounce. I'll see you all next week. This has been the Humanist Report. I'm Mike Figueredo. Take care, everyone.